These are called rational functions. Can anyone tell me why we call them rational functions? What does rational mean? Think back to our first lesson when we talked about complex numbers and uh, real numbers and rational numbers were a kind of number. What are rational numbers? They're like fractions and stuff, right? Like two thirds and uh, a half and three and five, five eighths or something like that. Those are rational numbers. These are rational functions because they are ratios between different functions. Okay? Now, we're going to tease out how to draw these and the principles, like I think most of you with some time could draw these without my help. But I'm going to try and draw out some principles that hopefully make it more efficient and um, help you to get the, the right answers, the right sort of picture up quicker. Okay? Right, let's have a look at this. Now, we're under the heading of multiplication and division. So each of these you can see is not just division of this and this, but there's also a whole lot of multiplication happening, right? The last one makes it the most obvious, right? Because you see, there's this times this times this, okay? It's not so obvious in these. So the first thing we need to do is to put this in a form that makes the multiplication obvious, right? In other words, we want to factorize, okay? To have a look at this top one, let's not make that an equal sign, let's make it an arrow. How can I factorize the numerator? So x minus 2x. Yeah, I can just take out an x, oh, wait, right? You're probably thinking of um, if I've done that, yeah. okay? Uh, if I take out an x, that's going to leave me with x minus 4. Can I factorize any further? Nope, done. Okay, denominator? X minus 2x minus 2. This looks like x minus 2x minus 3. Okay, you happy? Good. Now, we factorize, that's the first important step. And I'm going to use this as an acronym that I've been using for a while, which is, which is quite helpful, which is that you want your graphs to look fair. Now, fair is a very old-fashioned word. We tend to use it like, that's not fair. I only got a third of the pie and you got two thirds. We mean fair in terms of equity. But fair has another old-fashioned meaning. Does anyone know? It's, it means beauty, right? So something is fair, like fairies, that kind of thing. Um, so fair actually stands for something. The first letter you've already done, which is? Factorize. Okay, so F for factorize. The A <laughs> stands for a really important feature, two of them actually, which are really easy to find now that we've factorized it. Namely, I'm looking now for asymptotes. Okay, asymptotes. So you're factorized. Now we're going to look for asymptotes. Okay? Now, there are three kinds of asymptotes that you guys know about. Three kinds. But there are actually really two categories. Can you tell me what the three kinds of vertical, asymptotes are? Horizontal, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, or oblique. Okay, good. So these are the three kinds. So it's like, okay, these ones are up down, these ones are left to right, and then these guys are like off at a weirdo looking angle. Okay, that's fine. But actually, even though they look like they're three different things, these guys are really two versions of the same thing. And this one is very, very different. Let me try and justify that for you. Vertical asymptotes come from, have a look, this graph is going to have two vertical asymptotes. Can you see how I know what they are? Yeah, it's going to be two and three. It comes from the denominator, right? A vertical asymptote means it's part of the domain restriction. You can't go there. You can't put two or three in. It breaks down. Okay, so what I'm going to write is vertical asymptotes. And I've got x equals two, x equals three. Okay, now... A function can have, can have as many vertical asymptotes as you like. You could have, we've got two here, you could have one, you could have a hundred, right? How would I add more vertical asymptotes to a function? What would I do? Yeah, just, just put more stuff in the denominator, right? Put in an x minus one, an x plus one, an x. However many times you do that, you're going to get lots of those. Uh, in fact, a very famous function that you know about has an infinite number of vertical asymptotes because it's periodic. Does anyone know? Which one thing else? We're thinking of tan because tan is also a rational function. Do you see it? It is a rational function. So every time this denominator is zero, which is a, a lot of times, okay, <laughs> then, then you get a vertical asymptote. Yes? So that's the first thing you want to note about these. You can have loads and loads and loads of them. And um, they represent a, a restriction on the domain. Okay. Let's contrast that to a horizontal or oblique asymptote. Now I happen to know, and you're going to work it out in a second too, that this does not have an oblique asymptote, it has a horizontal asymptote. Does anyone know what it is? 
So remembering, uh, vertical asymptotes are up down lines, that's why they're x equals. <laughs> Horizontal asymptotes are all in the form y equals something. In this case, the y is equal to 1. Now, how do I know that? There's lots of ways you can analyze this. There are going to be two, two ways that I'm going to tell you about just quickly. There's one where you divide everything by, like say in this case, you divide everything by x squared. You can do that. I'm okay with that. I have never found that to be the way that clicks with my mind. Here's what I prefer, and hopefully I can justify this. Number one, uh, the horizontal asymptote or the oblique asymptote. Right? You remember how I, I lumped them together? Okay. In the middle of the function, right? So here's a famous one that you guys know. This guy has a vertical asymptote and has a horizontal asymptote, right? In fact, this picture is so easy to know. I hope this kind of picture jumps into your mind as soon as you see this, right? Now, we all know what the horizontal asymptote is for this guy. Tell me, what is the relevance of the horizontal asymptote in the middle of the graph, like around here? What relevance does it have? And the answer is it has none. Right? The function doesn't care about the horizontal asymptote in the middle. In fact, for this particular example, it races away from the asymptote, right? which is not what asymptotes are supposed to do. In fact, horizontal and oblique asymptotes, they only tell you what's going on, not in the middle, but at the edges here, right? as you go to positive infinity or negative infinity. Um, the word that sometimes textbooks use is the extremities, the extreme parts of the graph. That's what the horizontal or oblique asymptotes tell you about. Now for that reason, while you can have loads and loads and loads of vertical asymptotes, you can only ever have one horizontal or oblique asymptote. There's one, that's it. I don't need to go and find other ones, this is the only thing that it'll approach. Okay? Now how do I know that it's one that approaches and not two or three or four? Hmm. Okay, so as we mentioned, you could divide by x squared and get something out of that. But something I prefer to do is, being that it's about extreme values, just take an extreme value and substitute it in. A thousand, a million, something like that. Okay. Now, let's just have a look at the unfactorized form for a second. Do you notice that these guys here, the negative 4x, the minus 4x, the minus 5x, and the 6, okay, they're important, but not when x is a really big number. Do, do you notice that, right? Like for example, say the six, okay? If I put x is like a million into here, this is gonna be a million million. Who cares about this six? It's just gonna be so unimportant, okay? Um, even these guys, though they grow, they don't grow anything in comparison to these guys, right? So these are the ones that are really important. Do you agree? And that's why you maybe wanna um, circle these because it's so important. That's why when you first learn about polynomials, we bothered to give that term a name. We called it the leading term, right? Things only get names in mathematics or in any area of knowledge when they matter for some reason. And this is the reason they matter. The leading term tells you everything you need to know about the horizontal asymptote or the oblique asymptote. One's x squared on the top, there's an x squared on the bottom. As they get bigger, they get bigger at exactly the same rate. Right? So since you're dividing through, you just get that. Does that make sense? What if, don't write this because it'll make it messy, what if uh, this was a 2 down here? What would happen as I put huge, huge values in? Yeah, well, they're both, this is a 1 up here, which we don't write. They're both growing exactly the same rate. The 1 will stay there and the 2 will stay there. Right? So you just get a half. Or if I made this like, you know, 8 over 3, you're just going to get... Eight thirds, right? Whatever, okay? So those values there, they tell you what you're headed towards, so that's fine. Okay, you factorize, you work out the asymptotes, that's it, okay? I, come on, think, you're graphing. What's an important feature on a graph? Intercepts. Intercepts, thank you very much. Now, we read the asymptotes off the denominator and also by, by considering the whole thing together, right? Uh, where are you gonna read the intercepts off? Yeah, when x equals y equals zero, you factorize, so you've already made part of this easy for you. Do you see that? I can say x equals zero and x equals four. Here are my intercepts, right? X equals zero, x equals four. They're going to be my x-intercepts. Um, since I've got x equals zero, that means it's also a y-intercept, isn't it? That's, that's the origin, okay? So, um, there we go, I've got all the intercepts I want. 